Hi everyone, and thanks for joining me today. I know as young girls, a lot of us were taught that we shouldn't talk about politics and religion, but not today. I'm speaking to you as a women's health expert, as a mother of three teenage girls, as someone who has been in a position where I've had to consider abortion myself, and as someone who has gone through the process of deciding to end a pregnancy with countless patients and witnessing how heartbreaking and suffering it is for them. And here we are on this day, and I live in Texas, where the Supreme Court's decision yesterday has taken reproductive rights out of the hands of women and left them in the hands of states. And so in Texas, as of today, choosing to end a pregnancy, even one that was conceived through rape or incest, is now considered to be a crime. And healthcare providers who help a girl or woman to make this decision could be faced with life imprisonment as they would for murder of a living human being who's already in this world. For the past 24 hours, I've gone from red hot anger to crying to every emotion in between. And what I want to share with you the most is that I respect whatever opinion you hold on this topic because it's an opinion and everybody's opinion deserves to be respected. So please think twice before you fire off hateful comments calling me a baby murderer or saying that I am in favor of abortion or anything like that. And let's just come together as women and understand that people have different opinions and we have a right to those opinions. And maybe in this kind of setting, we can come together as women and examine our own hearts first. If we're going to have any kind of peace in this country, and speaking as a women's health care expert, I will really try to stay in my lane as a physician and a person who is a woman whose own body is very sacred to me and who has children whose bodies are sacred to them. Let's use this opportunity to come together and not to put gasoline on the fire of hatred that certain interests are using to divide us in so many ways. We're becoming so much more polarized and thinking of other people as some kind of non-human other that doesn't deserve the same compassion and love that each of us deserves and respects. So on this day, I've been reflecting on what in my spiritual tradition are the four qualities of love. And the four qualities of love in, in my spiritual tradition are kindness, which recognizes that every person wants to be happy and to act in ways that support that. Compassion, which recognizes suffering in others and wants to make that suffering go away. Appreciative joy, that's one of my favorites. The ability to be happy for other people's successes and happiness and equanimity, which is balance. And I've been really working on that today because this particular topic is so polarizing and pulls us out of balance. But equanimity is the ability to stay calm and balanced no matter what conditions are thrown at us. And just reflecting on a teaching that I really love so much that I've been listening to today over and over. You know, the conditions in life or the circumstances that are thrown at us or the content 
of the argument is almost irrelevant. It might be whatever it is. Today it's abortion rights. Yesterday it was something else. The content is almost irrelevant. It's my response to it that flavors my experience. So no matter what is happening in the outside world, I have the ability to bring my little piece to it. And may it be a piece that adds love, compassion, kindness to the situation and doesn't pour gasoline on the fire. So no matter what your opinion is about this particular Supreme Court decision, I'm sending you love. And as a women's health expert, I feel absolutely obliged to share what I'm feeling about it. Not because I'm right, because for damn sure I'm not right. I have my own opinions that are mine, and you do not have to agree with them, but I do ask you to respect them as I respect yours. I just want to share a couple of stories with you that have occurred to me today, and these are not unique to me. I know from working with thousands of women that these are things that have happened to so many of us. I hate the idea of abortion. <laughs> Nobody is pro-abortion. I've never met a human being who is pro-abortion. That is completely different than being in favor of allowing individuals to make their own choices. Abortion is probably the hardest decision that any woman will ever have to make if she's given that opportunity. I've never met a woman who found it easy. If you've read my book, you already know this about me, and I'm not unique in this situation, but I was raped when I was 13 by many people. I don't know how many. And I didn't become pregnant, but I knew afterwards that I might have become pregnant. And I waited for my period to come almost without sleeping. I didn't even know what had happened. I was a child. But I did know how babies were made because I was lucky to have the opportunity to be educated, which is not the same for everybody. And we have to remember that. I'm a very intelligent, educated person, and I was when I was 13. But had I become pregnant, and I was living in Texas in 2022, I would not be able to end that pregnancy in this state of Texas. That would be a criminal activity. Well, lucky for me, if that had been the case, I would have had the resources and finances to fly to Colorado or California and have a safe abortion. But that's not the case for every 13-year-old who's raped. It costs a lot of money to get on a plane and get to another state, and it also takes a lot of wherewithal, intelligence, gumption, education, money, and not everybody has those things. So I was reflecting today on what had happened, I'm 55 years old now, if that 13-year-old girl had become pregnant and she was not able to end the pregnancy as a result of being raped. And I was reflecting on when I did really want to be pregnant more than anything in the world at age 35 and it wasn't possible and I had to decide whether to not have children or to undergo fertility treatments and I chose the latter and with my first pregnancy for the first few weeks I had twins and I was overjoyed and one of them didn't survive and I had my first child uh, at age 35 uh, the twin passed away, and I had a very complicated pregnancy. I spent weeks in the hospital on bed rest, almost died during the delivery, got multiple units of blood, and thank God have a very healthy 19-year-old child. Well, my second pregnancy, I was pregnant for the first few weeks at age 37 with triplets, and I faced the most horrible 
decision about whether I would have to consider terminating one of the triplets in order for any of us four to survive. With the conditions that I had, my being an obstetrician myself and with the most educated uh, and many, many different opinions from the most educated people, I was told that carrying triplets for me would be a death sentence for all four of us. So I went through the process of considering how to terminate one of my three precious fetuses that I had spent countless thousands of dollars to achieve, and I sure as hell loved each one of them. And trying to choose which one it was mind-boggling and kept me awake for several weeks until one of them passed away on its own. And I delivered my twins at 35 weeks with severe preeclampsia, went into renal failure, almost died again, got multiple units of blood, and thank God those two children are now healthy and well. But had I carried triplets, all four of us would have died. And I'm not saying that to be dramatic, but just to say that I know what it's like to consider ending a pregnancy, and it's not easy for anyone ever. Nobody is pro-abortion. Nobody wants to kill babies. You can see behind me pictures of my most glorious days when I delivered thousands of babies, and it was part of the joy of bringing those babies into the world in what I hoped and prayed was a healthy manner and sometimes was fraught with disaster and tragedy. But believe me, <laughs> as a woman health professional who has devoted my life to helping women and babies be healthy and well, the last thing I want is to end anybody's life. So I thought about what I wanted to say today because I felt like I needed to say something. I was going to make a video about something really fun to do with hormone replacement or weight loss, but it just seemed like that doesn't matter today. I went to see the Elvis movie today to take my mind off of all of this, and if you haven't seen it, please go see it. It's probably one of the best movies that I've seen in five years. But part of the movie highlights how Elvis Presley was in a remarkable position during the 1950s in the middle of the civil rights movement and crossed the barriers between what white people are supposed to do and what black people were supposed to do. And he was actually going to be put in jail because his style of dancing was breaking the segregation laws at the time because he was dancing like a black man. And how hard it is to believe that only that long ago, these laws were intact and that somebody could be put in jail for dancing in a manner that offended the group who was in power. And according to the story, uh, Elvis Presley chose to uh, serve in the armed forces for two years instead of being put in jail and came back and as we know, has uh, changed the culture of music and really of the world by bringing together African-American music and rhythm and blues and white country music in a style that was completely unique. And so during the movie, we were reminded of the horrific things that happened during the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King's murder, um, the murder of the Kennedys, that's uh, countless other loss of life from people who had made it their life's work to fight for freedom for all human beings. In that case, obviously, a racial issue and the women who fought for all of the rights that women now have and have had up until yesterday. I haven't cried in a movie for a long time, and maybe I would have cried in that movie anyway, but certainly in the light of what's going on today, it just made me wonder how much progress we've really made and how we need to hang on to the progress that we have made. We fought so hard 
to get the rights that we currently have for minorities and underprivileged, marginalized people, whether they're women, people of color, gays, transgender people, people of all genders, elderly people, every kind of people, because we are all human beings and we all have equal rights. Now, some of you might be jumping right ahead to thinking, well, what about a fetus's equal rights? And I get it. I completely understand your position. And sometimes we have to make really difficult decisions for the greater good. And, and whenever somebody considers ending the life of an embryo or a fetus that has no consciousness yet, it's a really difficult decision. So back when this all started being apparent that it was going to happen last year, I wrote a piece that is on my website and I revisited it today. You know, at that time, Texas uh, was threatening to make abortion illegal for pregnancies that had a heartbeat. That's gestations over six weeks from conception. And so now we're even in a different place where Texas is outlawing any ending of a pregnancy prior to having a heartbeat, even after conception, and even in situations like incest and rape with almost no exceptions. So I read the article that I wrote and I didn't think there was really anything better that I could say. I edited it a little bit to update it for the current situation. And if you've read it before, you know, feel free to tune out at this point, but for my own heart and to express what I'm feeling and what I know a lot of you are feeling because I've had so many texts and emails from other women who are scared people who are scared, not just women, um, gay people, transgender people, people who are fearing that other rights that we've taken for granted will now be stripped away, rights that we thought would never be taken away, that we fought so long and hard for. People are scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. So I'm, I'm going to read the piece that I wrote last year with a few edits, and I hope that what I say is not going to inflame or put gas on the fire of hatred or division, but help us to think about ways that we can all honor each other's opinions and come together and realize that our opinions are just opinions and that perhaps we shouldn't force those on other people, but rather respect other people's opinions. In this case, when it comes to a really important women's health issue. As a woman, a mother, and physician who's dedicated my life to serving the health and well-being of women, my mind has been reeling after yesterday's ruling by the Supreme Court of the United States, overturning the constitutional right to abortion and directing the decision about whether abortion is legal back to individual states. As a resident of Texas, where abortion at any gestational age is now illegal with almost no exceptions, not even for pregnancies too early for a heartbeat or as a result of incest or rape, I've spent the last 24 hours sitting with my thoughts and trying to understand what's really going on here and why this is so important to me and to everyone, because it is important. And it's a symptom of a disturbing trend in our country, much greater than a woman's right to make her own reproductive choices. In a country that was founded on the deep belief in freedom, where countless people have died to win and protect those freedoms, a country in which we apparently lead the world as an example of democracy, one of a woman's most basic freedoms has just been stripped away when over 85% of American voters are not in favor of this decision, which is worth mourning in itself and also leaves me wondering what other freedoms are up for grabs. Most of us recognize that we're fortunate to live in a country where we can each have our own opinions and that the right to safe disagreement and debate are part of the very fabric of our constitution. I have opinions about a lot of things, 
My opinions are not facts. No one gets upset or argues about facts. We don't argue about the existence of gravity or get upset about 2 plus 2 equaling 4. We get upset about our opinions when others disagree with them. And we force each other further and further into our respective corners defending what in, our, in their essence are arguable ideas. More and more we've become polarized, fed by targeted news and social media that appeals to and feeds our points of view, and by leaders who no longer can have intelligent debates and be open to listening to and learning from the other side. We're so sure that we're right and the other, other is wrong. We seem to have lost our ability to be open-minded and consider all sides. Now, I have a pretty strong opinion about this new law, and I have a right to that opinion. If you disagree with me, then you have a right to your opinion, too. I have no interest in fighting, arguing, name-calling, bullying, or other divisive behavior. However, I do have an interest in understanding each other, respectfully disagreeing, and allowing people to make up their own minds and act in accordance with what they believe is best for them. We need to mind our own business. I have a right to live my life as I choose, and so do you. Of course, I don't have a right to harm others with my choices, and my freedom doesn't extend to infringing on your freedom. So your freedom to smoke cigarettes doesn't allow you to affect my right to breathe clean air, so you can smoke in designated areas. I have a legal right to drink alcohol, but not to put your life at risk by driving a car when I'm drunk. I have a right to have sex with or marry whomever I choose, regardless of gender, but I don't have a right to have sex with you and not tell you if I have herpes. These are ideas that most of us accept and understand. Generally, we leave each other alone and mind our own business regarding personal life choices and especially religious beliefs and choices, despite our own opinions or preferences. I might feel strongly that people shouldn't smoke, and as a physician, I will inform smokers of the risks and ultimately let them make their own decisions. But making smoking, using alcohol, or homosexuality illegal would generally be regarded as government overstepping its role in making laws that are designed to keep society safe and orderly rather than imposing personal opinions on the population that is outside the scope of the law. Whether or not a woman or child should be able to choose an abortion is something that you probably have an opinion about too. I have one for sure, but the arguments on both sides are so far removed from the scope of facts that people on all sides get incredibly upset. Abortion rights probably top the list of long-standing heated controversies in our country and other countries. People are often pushed to using hateful, violent language and even to physically harm and kill each other, defending their opinions about abortion. And again, we don't get upset about facts. We get upset about opinions. Here's another example of my opinions. Government has no business making laws that criminalize behaviors which are personal choices, especially when those laws are driven largely by religious beliefs that are not shared by the majority of people. A foundational part of our country's constitution was the separation of church and state, which, as we know, prevented the dominant church from making laws that restricted the rights of those who had dissenting beliefs and opinions and allowed each of us to be free to follow and freely practice our own spiritual beliefs based on our own conscience. A subset of American people holds religious beliefs that make abortion seem like murder to them, and I am respectful of that opinion. I personally spent many, many years in a Catholic family, and I'm incredibly familiar with that point of view. Someone with that opinion would not choose to have an abortion, and that makes perfect sense. If you're Catholic, an evangelical Christian, or otherwise think murder is the same as abortion, I respect your opinion. 
and I would ask you to respect mine. But by no means should your opinion or mine be made into a law because it's just an opinion. And we live in a country that respects the freedom of each person to make their own choices. So why is this different? Well, the crux of the matter seems to be disagreement about when a human has rights and when it doesn't. If my right to do what I want is limited to not preventing you from doing what you want, then of course I can't kill you. That makes perfect sense. But the debate about when a fetus becomes a human with the same rights as a human living outside the womb will li likely never end. There is no clear answer and there never will be. So again, we're back in the realm of opinions. Friday's Supreme Court ruling decided that states are free to rule that a fertilized human egg has the same right to live as a fully developed human adult fertile woman. Okay, so that is one way to look at it. I respect that opinion, but it is unarguably arbitrary. Another way to look at it, which is equally arbitrary, is that prior to 23 weeks pregnancy, which in medical terms amounts to 21 weeks from conception, a fetus is completely dependent on its mother for life and cannot survive alone. Under this argument, Prior to 23 weeks, the fetus is essentially part of its mother and as such has rights that are under the umbrella of its mother's rights. If that's your opinion, which I'm not saying is correct, it's just an opinion, a fetus that is pre-viable, that's prior to 23 weeks from last menstrual period, essentially belongs to its mother, giving the mother the right to choose how to manage its existence. Two arguments, neither one is correct. They're just opinions. Most people by far agree that once a fetus can survive on its own outside the uterus and the outside world, it has its own independent rights. I can understand all of these arguments and I recognize that they're opinions and I recognize that it's quite unlikely that this quandary will ever be solved because it's based on opinion, not science. So I choose to get out of other people's business and let them make their own decisions. That seems to be the American thing to do and is certainly supported by our Constitution. Whichever way I slice it, this law seems to be giving greater rights to a fertilized egg with no consciousness than to its mother, who is a conscious living human already here on this earth. Sometimes we have to choose the greater good. Sometimes choices are really hard and not everyone can win. And this law seems to me to, to be dismissing the rights of a living human female in favor of fetuses who have no understanding of their own existence. This is not easy. Being opposed to this law does not mean that I'm pro-abortion. I am not for murder, as one of my critics posted on Instagram. Abortion is horrible. It's perhaps the hardest decision that an affected woman ever makes in her life. I've been a gynecologist for over 22 years and I have never met a girl or woman considering abortion who wasn't devastated by the difficulty of the decision. It's a horrible decision to make, but ultimately way to be better than the alternative for those who choose it. It's easy to make blanket statements about people sh what people should do when you've never been in their shoes. I've met countless women over the years who were staunchly anti-abortion, but felt, felt differently once they or their daughter or relative had an unwanted pregnancy. If it happens to you and it's in your backyard, suddenly it becomes very, very real. And the idea that women should just take birth control and they shouldn't be getting having unwanted pregnancies is completely unrealistic. Birth control is available, but not all young women are educated about it. It doesn't always work. And remember, a lot of pregnancies are not through consensual sex. There are so many reasons why just take birth control is not the solution, although I absolutely promote it. Here are some of, the things, some of the things that really scare me about this current law, and they should scare all of us, in my opinion. Of course, this law was designed to make 
abortion practically impossible in states like Texas since one would have to have the intellectual and financial means to travel out of state to obtain a safe abortion. People who would be able to jump over those hurdles would be much more likely to be well-educated, white, have significant financial resources, and either be over 18 or have parental support, which is not always the case. And as often happens, much more of the burden falls on the less educated, poorer minorities. Family members of privileged people like me or our Texas governor could hop on a plane to California and have a safe abortion in a clean, comfortable facility with a highly skilled doctor if that's what they chose. And those with the least ability to take care of an unwanted child would be the most likely to be forced to have that unwanted child or to seek an illegal abortion. Which brings me to my second fear. Making abortion illegal will not stop people getting abortions. We know this from our past. Abortions will be pushed underground to more and more unsafe settings. The price will go up and truly criminal elements will take advantage of the situation and mothers will get sick and die. And this is in a situation where the United States already has the worst mortality record for pregnant patients out of all developed countries. Our maternal mortality history is shocking already, and we're about to make it 10 times worse. Unregulated abortions will lead to life-threatening infections, uterine perforations, bowel injuries, scarring and infertility, and death. And these horrible outcomes will fall on those who are least able to get help. And let's talk about some of the largest groups of people who seek abortions. Girls who are not yet adults and do not have the mental capacity to understand the ramifications of sex and pregnancy. We don't let teenagers under 18 make life-changing decisions about anything because we know their brains are not fully formed yet. And then, of course, girls and women who did not consent to sex that resulted in pregnancy. This is a, not a matter of teaching girls to think twice before they open their legs, as another one of my critics posted on Instagram, or just use birth control, as another person said. All too often, the girl did not open her legs. Her legs were forced open or she didn't have the capacity to consent because she was a child, was uneducated about sex and pregnancy, and or did not have the resources to get birth control. I'm not really sure if I can count my fears about this law, but here's one more. This is just one law. And it indicates to me that this country is heading in a scary direction that has nothing to do with democracy because most Americans and even most Texans are not in favor of this law, nor were we even asked about it. These things happen in other countries, right? Not ours, so I thought. We spent over $2 trillion. That's $2 million million in Afghanistan over the past 20 years and countless lives were lost or damaged fighting against a regime that seems to laugh at democracy, treats women as second-class citizens, and engages in horrendous human rights abuses. Yet on our own soil, we are stripping away the rights of women and at the same time allowing greater and almost unlimited access to guns that kill or injure over 100,000 people every year. So shouldn't we be worrying more about that? than what an individual girl or woman decides to do with her own reproductive life. I am scared. Sometimes I think our country's gone crazy and threatening doctors who help girls and women to safely end their pre pregnancy with life imprisonment. That sounds like the plot from a scary futuristic movie about a place where I don't want to live. How is this helping make a better world? At the same time, we've got the right to choose not to get vaccinated against COVID-19, which puts other people's lives at risk. We've got the right to smoke cigarettes. We can ride a motorcycle without a helmet. We can have a handgun in our purse with less than a cursory background check, and we can text while driving. How can we pass a law preventing abortion to protect the rights of a pre-conscious fetus when we support freedoms in so many other ways that outwardly lead to countless deaths of people who are alive and breathing right now. 
Sometimes I think we just have to stop and look at how inconsistent this all is. We need to rethink things. What do you really believe is right? And why do you care so much about what other people do? We just have to stop and think. Here is a fact. At the time of puberty, a woman has about 300,000 eggs in her ovaries, and only several hundred will be released during her lifetime, usually about one a month from an average of age 12 through 50, with breaks during pregnancy or when on birth control. And each one of these eggs is part of a potential human. When combined with just one of the 200 million sperm that are present in an average ejaculate. More than 50% of pregnancies or fertilized eggs die in the first week after conception before pregnancy is even recognized. Eggs and sperm, as well as lots of tiny embryos, come and go every day without us batting an eye. This is nature, and we all regularly interfere with nature's processes by using natural family planning, which of course is avoiding sex when we're fertile, using withdrawal or preventing egg release with birth control pills or creating barriers to contraception with condoms, IUDs, tubal ligation, vasectomy. No matter what your opinion is about birth control, all of us use our intelligence to manipulate the natural process to some extent. That's a fact. Now here's my opinion. The idea that egg fertilization and the resulting embryo is somehow preordained seems to me to be magical thinking and completely ignores science. Egg fertilization is the absolute epitome of randomness. Being born as a unique human is an incredibly random event in the course of a reproductive life. And the world arguably has too many people already Overpopulation is right up there with climate change on the list of current planetary emergencies. Which makes me think that we should really focus on carefully choosing the children that we want out of the billions of potential possible ones that we could have. And not be forced by a law to have ones that we don't want. Here's the bottom line for me. Why do we care so much about what other people are doing when it does not affect us? Perhaps we could spend more time examining our own lives and ways we could become more kind, compassionate, open-minded, and loving. Spend less time being right about things that are simply our opinions and stop trying to force our opinions on others. If you don't want to get an abortion, you absolutely should not do so. You have the freedom to do what your conscience supports, so long as it doesn't infringe on my freedom, and that's American. We hold ourselves up as the leaders of the free world, and right now I feel embarrassed. We simply must do better because the world is watching us, not to mention we need to look at ourselves in the mirror. How about this? Let's mind our own business and be kind. That's a platform I can stand behind. Be kind to each other. Let's not pour gasoline on this fire. Let's not be fighting about abortion rights. Let's understand each other and move forward with love. And the four foundations of love, as far as I know, are kindness, compassion, joy for others, happiness, and equanimity. I'll see you next week.